I want you to do something for me. I want you to think of all of your comfort games. You know, the ones that you play when you don't know what else to play. The games that feel like a default for you. A game that you'll be playing again and again for as long as you're alive, and for one reason or another makes you feel comfortable, like you're wrapped up in a warm blanket. A game that makes you feel like everything is going to be alright. For some of you, this might be Animal Crossing, with its insanely chilled out town management, as well as its unparalleled reverence for the importance of good decor. For others, it could very well be the heart-pounding action of a game like Call of Duty, and its very similar level of reverence for the realism of your average armed forces conscript. Jokes aside, we all have vastly different pieces of media that we'll go to for comfort and needing to feel safe. Offerings that make us forget about what's outside the walls that we generally reside in, whether they're the metaphorical or the literal. And, on occasion, allow us to pull those walls down and invite people inside that enjoy the same things we do. For me, my comfort games are spread far and wide across genres, but at the very, very top of that list sits survival horror. I know that might make me sound weird, but I don't care. Arriving at El Pueblo as Leon, whether it's in Resident Evil 4 Remake or the original, always for some strange reason feels like going home, as cheesy and stupid as that sounds. It was my first real out of the frying pan, into the toaster, fish out of water moment that I truly experienced in video games. Conversely, heading back to Silent Hill in search of Cheryl always feels like a vacation where I'm visiting a town that I have this strange sense of nostalgia for. No real reason for it, but there's some weird fuzzy love there. And again, I know this doesn't make me sound sane or normal. Whenever a new survival horror title comes out, I'm always hoping that it's going to be added to my rotation of games that I find myself playing year after year for the rest of my life. And wouldn't you know it, just such a title has finally come along yet again. So, grab your gear, let's all get on the bus or van or whatever floats your boat, and head on down to Georgia's favorite family getaway, Crow Country. <laughs> We're here! We've arrived at a theme park full of magic that the entire family can enjoy. Take a ride on the swan boats located in Fairytale Town. Maybe head on over to the haunted hilltop to experience all the frights you can stomach. Afterwards, make sure to stop by Neptune's Palace to grab a bite to eat. And don't forget to drop in to our lovely gift shop and spend some more money. Just don't ask us about the mushroom in the cooler. <laughs> you will be banned. Crow Country where family fun meets the scariest shit you've ever fucking seen. This game first hit my radar when Zack and I were browsing Steam in the hopes of finding a game that could scratch that Resident Evil itch. In doing so, we stumbled upon a demo that featured roughly the first hour of the game. After finishing said demo, I'm sure it goes without saying that we were plenty excited for the game's full release in the coming months. It had so much, if not all, of what we were looking for. A great aesthetic, fun mechanics, and amazing sound. Everything about Crow Country feels and looks perfectly crafted, from the spectacular creature design all the way down to something like the sound effect when you pick ammo up. I'll tell you what, it almost felt like this game was made for me. But does this rundown theme park really have the thrills, chills, and spills that can make up a great survival horror title? Well, grab your ticket and let's head on inside. So Crow Country is obviously a survival horror title, with an emphasis on backtracking, puzzle solving, and combat in order to make your way deeper and deeper into the decrepit theme park of the same name. You play as the titular Mara Forest, a real go-getter who's heading to the park to investigate the disappearance of its owner, Edward Crow, and maybe along the way find out why it was closed down in the first place. From the moment you arrive, you'll have a litany of questions, chief among them what the hell? Don't worry, most will be revealed, so long as you survive the frights that await within the confines of the park's many lands. 
Crow Country takes notes from a few games from the PlayStation 1 era, Resident Evil 2, Silent Hill, and Final Fantasy VII. And while you can clearly see that inspiration, this offering is more than able to set itself apart as its own thing. I feel that sometimes inspiration, if too strong or mismanaged, can get in the way of any other ideas and overshadow projects, but luckily there's a lot going for this one, and overshadowed it is not by any of its sources. First of all, this game is gorgeous. Maybe not in the way most people judge a game's visual quality these days, but it's got it everywhere that it counts. When reviewing Pacific Drive, I harped on how the visual design and quality was going to allow the game to age like a fine wine, and Crow Country is at that same level, if not even higher in that regard. It harkens back to the days of the PlayStation and its warbly graphics, but improves upon that by making sure textures stay in place while keeping that fuzzy look that blends the models and world together. It reminds me of the dithering effect in Silent Hill that reduces the resolution in favor of performance while subtly making things more creepy looking. Our brains, after all, love filling in details where we perceive little to none, and the dark corners of a rotting theme park are no exception. Every inch of this park is designed to near perfection, featuring a spoken wheel type design as though it were a slightly more rotten Disneyland and full of nearly as many insanely well-designed monsters. I do say spoken wheel loosely. It's more of a cross. Anyway, I digress. Look, it may be rated T, but that never once stopped this game from being the horrifying when and where it wanted to be. There's also something I love to talk about constantly, and that's a world's density. That a small world is more than good enough, so long as it's packed with detail and feels lived in, or in this case, left behind. In the case of Crow Country, Dents would be putting it lightly. I really feel as though someone who has experience designing theme parks took a crack at this one. It's dense enough to be considered a neutron star in the world of video games. Every square inch of this theme park oozes artistic prowess, both in a visual sense and narratively speaking. And speaking of narratively speaking, it's got a super engaging story. One that I will not be spoiling here, naturally. Just know that it's no slouch in the genre, and it will probably surprise you from time to time. I found Mara as a protagonist hilarious and all too relatable. I think anyone who plays games like these might find themselves complaining about why the world works the way it does if they were in her shoes. Just imagine a world where every house you visit is like a carnival funhouse with a curse. Needing to find objects, codes, and really weird keys in order to get around would certainly take getting used to, and Mara is a real trooper, all things considered. I found, much like with any game in this space, the story only got more fun the farther along I went, and by the end, I was thoroughly satisfied with my journey, enough to play it again and again. It was also enhanced a fair bit further by the fact that it was pretty easy to follow, and very well paced throughout. I know that when it comes to horror, the narratives can get super weird, and a lot of the time, very hard to follow, but that was not an issue here. Regarding pacing, every bit of information I could find was fed to me at, well, a near-perfect pace, not letting me get bored or overwhelmed at any point by detail or lack thereof. It's just such an accessible game overall, and it was so refreshing not needing to turn my brain on to 11 for every single little thing. Not that that is a bad thing, mind you, but every now and then I would like things to be a little more straightforward and a little more simple than normal, and this game really brought that home for me. It's a game that has a wildly strong sense of style and storytelling, and it's all capped off with the cherry on top that is, of course, the perfect soundtrack and score, courtesy of Akeroid. very well aware of how the game looks and sounds, but how does it play? Well, for starters, Crow Country should be able to run on just about anything from a 4090 to a first-gen Samsung smart fridge, and if you make that happen, be sure to let me know because that would be hilarious. I never saw a single frame dip or crash in my entire non-stop six-hour playthrough the day it was released. Sure, just by looking at it, you could have surmised that already, but these days, you never really know what state a game is going to release in. Thankfully, this game was done and ready to play, save for very small bugs that were patched almost immediately. Performance felt almost moot to really speak about, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention how nice it was to play a game on release day that worked. 
and worked very well. Moving on, let's talk about accessibility. Crow Country is a pretty easy game, but if you ever feel as though things are too intense, you do have an option I personally love, which is that you can completely turn off enemies in combat upon the creation of a new game. At that point, you can treat the game as though it were a spooky and immersive puzzle title. It may not have the exhaustive accessibility options of games like Pacific Drive, but the fact that you can completely turn off scary monsters and fighting is a pretty awesome step to get more people to maybe want to try it. It's been great to see how many games from across genre boundaries have been putting in the effort to have or invite a more casual audience in without getting in the way of folks who need to challenge themselves and get better scores on runs or something like that. As far as the rest of the gameplay is concerned, if you played any survival horror titles, you will be right at home here. You're gonna be fighting, juking, gathering, and backtracking like you damn well should be. I want to start by talking about what I think is the biggest draw of the genre in many ways. The puzzles. In survival horror, the puzzles aren't only used to prevent physical progress through the world, but if the job is done right, perform some environmental storytelling. They can let you in on what the world was like before all the nasty shit went down, and add a good bit of lore by forcing you to revisit areas of the game you've been to already. I feel like I'm either preaching to the choir here or sounding like a crazy person, but yet again, I digress. Crow Country's puzzles are a great example of getting the player to learn more about the world. A lot of them will see you finding notes from former employees about why certain items aren't where they should be anymore. Even if that look into the past is simpler, it's still fun to be shown a hint of the before times of the long, long ago. Now, a good puzzle does not need to do any of those things to be good, or to even be great. But, of course, things like this are enhanced by making more sense in the context of the world they reside in. And not once in Crow Country did I ever feel like a single puzzle was way too out of left field. Puzzles aside, this is a horror game after all, so there will be times we have to fight the creatures in the dark in order to move forward or make our way back somewhere a lot safer than before. The combat in Crow Country, while not genre-defining, is definitely a step up from something like, uh, let's say, the original Resident Evil. I really like being able to specifically line up my shots with much more precision. I know that the comparison here is between a game that came out, like, a month ago, and one that came out two months after I was born, but still. I can tell they wanted something reminiscent of the old dogs of survival horror, but with a more modern twist, and I think they did a great job of doing it. Especially since it does go a bit deeper, and that you can't simply stand a mile away and pick an enemy off from complete safety. The closer you are, the more damage you do. So if you want to be ammo conscious, as you should be, you'll need to weigh the pros and cons of getting up in an enemy's grill versus just running around and maybe dealing with it later. Or not at all. Speaking of dealing with an enemy later, you can, of course, play the juking game and conserve as much ammo as you possibly can, but the game throws another little thing your way to make sure you don't get too cocky and let your guard down. After a certain point, you'll start noticing traps scattered throughout that, believe me, will get you more than you think they will. It's a near-perfect way of making sure that you can't blast through everything as easily as humanly possible right off the bat. The game makes sure you keep your guard up at all times, so even if you do play it like I did and kill everything in your path to make sure backtracking is safer, the traps will make certain that it's not that easy. On many occasions, I found myself getting bested by a goddamn poison-spitting crow or a falling chandelier. It genuinely feels as though no single mechanic was half-assed. The fighting feels simple, but effective. The exploration feels rewarding and fulfilling, and there are plenty of secrets to find that lead to great replay value. I have replayed through the game at least three times now, and not one single subsequent playthrough felt less rewarding or more boring. Crow Country truly feels awesome to play, regardless of which aspect of it you're talking about. In that regard, it almost feels weird talking about the things that I didn't like, but not enough to actually not, of course. There are, as there always are, at least a couple complaints I had about this one. Now, I'm gonna try to keep this section a little short, because as you could probably tell, I love this game. And there was very little I had to bitch and moan about. Like, almost nothing, I promise. The main gripe I found myself having while making my way through the game is that some of the enemy encounters were a bit too easy. Now, of course, I've been playing games like this for years, so it might be of no surprise that I would have less trouble than a newcomer. But there are some enemies, for example, that are special types that are larger and scarier than the usual ones, but they don't really seem to be that much more difficult. 
Luckily, at the time of writing, the developer has released a small roadmap that includes a hard mode coming very soon. So for those of you that need a ball-busting experience, I'm sure this will entice you a lot more than the standard mode. My next issue was the game's map. It is serviceable and far from useless, but I do wish it was a bit more specific about player location. It will tell you the general area you're in, but on more than one occasion I couldn't find where I was at all. This may have been a bug, but I do doubt it. This is not to say that I feel that a video game map needs to show you exactly where you are at all times without fail in order to be good. It was just, for this particular case, I kind of bounced off how it was designed. One thing the map does do really well, though, is mark a room you left a puzzle unsolved in, so that part's great. All in all, it was just fine and didn't harsh my vibe. So, at the end of all that, where do I really fully stand on Crow Country? I loved it. Yeah, I know it's been obvious the entire time, but I loved it. This is just another title in a huge list of indie games that make the AAA gaming market look and feel completely insane. Crow Country is just further proof that indie developers should always be protected and supported at all costs, because more often than not, they're able to make projects that feel huge despite being smaller. Crow Country may be smaller in size and shorter in length than most, if not all, of what inspired it. But it feels just as monumental as those other titles, and if I could, I would put it right on my shelf next to Silent Hill and Resident Evil. And, as I mentioned before, at $20, you'd be insane not to give this one a try. It is the true definition of a passion project, and it deserves every bit of the attention it's getting and so much more. It's a remarkable little title that will forever be in my rotation of comfort games, and I really, really hope that it can be the same for you. All right, uh, it's getting a little hot in here. This fire is huge, so I'm gonna head on out, but I'll catch you guys later. Okay, see ya. Oh, Jesus.